Well, guys, do we have some newsy nuggets for you on this, the 13th of August. First, Scott Peterson is breaking his silence. Um, he does have a docudrama that is having an exclusive with him, I believe, on Peacock. And then Netflix has the Lacey Peterson um, sort of side of things, though they do give an opportunity for his sister and I think sister-in-law to speak on his innocence. But he did not talk to the Netflix documentary now, in the Netflix documentary, I did report yesterday that Amber Frey or Fry did speak on the Netflix, um, you know, documentary. So it does show, at least by the receipts that she brought or what we read in the article, that she was quite unaware that she was being duped. But this is the first time that Scott Peterson has talked to the public in 20 years. So let's see what he has to say. Scott Peterson breaks his silence, quote, I was an a-hole to Lacey, but I didn't kill my wife. This is an exclusive from People. Um, I've never, I don't think I buy People magazines, but I will look at the front pages as I'm, you know, being held hostage by slow people in front of me in line at Walmart. For the first time in more than 20 years, the convicted murderer of Lacey Peterson and Connor Peterson speaks out on a new Peacock documentary, Face to Face with Scott Peterson. Sitting in the noisy day room of Mule Creek State Prison in Lone, California, as he speaks over grainy video call, Scott Peterson looks more like a laid-back surfer than a man convicted of the heinous 2002 murder of his wife Lacey and their unborn son, Connor. His hair, which some, he sometimes wears in a ponytail, is long and tousled, and his demeanor is calm and friendly. I understand this is People magazine, but I really don't want to hear about his man bun. I will be fully honest you, with you all. I think cheating on your pregnant wife is gross and disgusting, and I have no respect for him as a husband. I am willing to be wrong, and, you know, if, if evidence comes out that he didn't do this. I just don't know. If I were a betting woman, I would not bet on him being fully exonerated. Call me crazy. Uh, he does turn to more serious, you know, kind of demeanor as he discusses the terrible mistake he made when a month before the murder, he began an extramarital affair with Fresno, California massage therapist, Amber Frey. It's horrible, he said. I was a total a hell to be having sex outside our marriage. Well, I mean, you said it, I didn't. And speaking out for the first time on camera since his uh, arrest 21 years ago, Scott isn't just seeking to set the record straight on his affair. In Face to Face with Scott Peterson, a three-part docuseries premiering on Peacock on August 20th, the former Modesto fertilizer salesperson, now serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole, is once again denying any involvement in the disappearance and death of Lacey and her unborn child. He's also appealing to the public to listen to his side of the story of what he calls the so-called investigation carried out by the police and prosecutors who he claims ignored significant leads and relied solely on circumstantial evidence in their quest to convict him of double murder during his trial in 2020 or 2004. Now, the problem with this is that circumstantial cases, cases only on, you know, the evidence you can find that links this person to the trial or to the crime. I mean, there are plenty of cases where there's never going to be a witness, where there's not going to be video, where you're not going to have the exact idea of what happened. Chandler Halderson was a circumstantial case. They did not have, you know, actual footage of him unaliving his parents. They had to deduce, they had to hypothesize what happened and show that he was really the only person that could have done it by circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence cases are not you know, bad cases. They are simply cases that rely on many small pieces of evidence to be linked together to show that, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, this is the person that did this. Uh, people, you know, throw around circumstantial cases, and I did before I started watching trials, thinking that they were somehow lesser. 
but it simply means that you have many small links to get this person, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt. It doesn't mean it was a total foobar case. But as I said, I am I am willing to be proven wrong. I am wrong about many things. Ask all of my children when they try to teach me Roblox. I I, there is no shame in in saying that you don't know everything or that your opinion can be changed with evidence. But thus far, there has not been a great outpouring of evidence that makes me want to change my mind that Scott Peterson was pretty much the only one who planned and had the means, motive, and opportunity to do this crime. Like I said, willing to be you know completely proven wrong, but I don't see it. Now, Scott says that he regrets not testifying at his trial, but I have a chance now to show people what the truth is, and if they are willing to accept it, it would be the biggest thing I can accomplish right now because I didn't kill my family. The Peacock documentary also chronicles the appeals launched last January by the Los Angeles Innocence Project in an attempt to overturn Scott's conviction by proving his innocence. During his five-month-long murder trial that ended in November 2004, prosecutors described Scott as a man who regretted that he would soon become a father and committed murder to get out of his marriage without having to pay spousal or child support. I mean, if you look at some of the documentation that the state has, and I plan to get that back on rotation because we still have a bunch of the 300-page state's response to the Innocence Project asking for DNA. Now, the, the judge did grant that additional DNA testing. Um, basically, what the Innocence Project and Scott Peterson's, you know, sort of defense is, is that there was a break-in across the street, and they allege that instead of Scott having anything to do with Lacey and Connor being unalived, that these random burglars either, um, you know, surprised or came upon Lacey when they were trying to do a burglary at their house. So he does believe that um, additional DNA testing of duct tape, I think, found on Lacey's body or in the case would exonerate him because it would not be his DNA. That is so offensive and disgusting, he says about the prosecution's allegations. I certainly regret cheating on Lacey, absolutely. It was about a childish lack of self-esteem, selfish me traveling somewhere lonely that night because I wasn't home. Someone makes you feel good because they want to um, have this sexy time with you. Now, this would all make sense, except he deliberately sought out and held himself out as a single person. He was introduced to Amber Frey because one of the colleagues that he went to, I believe, a fertilizer convention with, you know, he was talking about how he wanted to meet a good girl and he wanted a relationship. So I'm sorry, but this isn't a chick you met at a bar. You actively pursued relationships. So you know, we have receipts. We can't, we, there are witnesses that say you are looking for a good woman and, you know, she introduced you to her single mom friend. So nice try. One of Peterson's staunchest supporters in the documentary is his sister-in-law, Janie Peterson, who became a lawyer in part to fight for, fight for his freedom. She tells people that Scott's affair and his dishonesty was devastating and upsetting to her and Scott's family. Scott lied about cheating and that was upsetting, said Janie Peterson, but he wasn't charged with infidelity. He was charged with murder. So I think we're conflating things here. I think that, yes, public opinion, my opinion is this man is a mega douche who, you know, was sleazy and slimy and lied to a lot of people in his life. But as I'm going through that state documentation of what they had, the investigation, how he lied to investigators, how, you know, he made a bunch of anchors, he, you know, researched the currents in the bay, she magically ends up in the bay. They never find the other, you know, five anchors that look like they were made because there were voids in the concrete dust. I mean, at some point, explain that away or stop talking. I mean, I I understand that might be, you know, something they can't do because the case he's technically appealing, but answer those questions. 
you know, make it make sense to me. I'm willing to listen, but just, you know, telling me that, well, he, yeah, sure, he's a bit of a jerk. He, you know, cheated on his wife. But, you know, other than that, he's a pretty good guy, is not going to win me over. Now, in another story, after many delays and a possible cyber attack, last night, Trump and Elon Musk broke the internet. After technical delays, Trump talked immigration and tech policy with Elon Musk. And I will say that I did not watch this. I have to rewatch here later. Um, I do know, look, getting boys to actually take showers, wash their hair with soap, I didn't have time to deal with Elon Musk and Trump. But they did talk about a lot of things. Um, and, you know, this isn't really a political channel, but it is something that was pretty big news. Uh, it did have so many, you know, viewers and it looked like it attracted 1.3 million listeners at its peak, according to X's public tally. Uh, this has happened. It looks like Trump is scaling back his live appearances, obviously, for good reason. Uh, but... I do think that this shows, and with the struggles that I think the Harris campaign is having building this organic internet, you know, culture around her sort of zeitgeist, I feel like this is going to be an election that maybe comes down to who can better reach people through alternate means. So this is still a big story. I won't be getting into the politics of everything. But it definitely was a very big change, and Trump got back to X. Now, um, well, you know, this police officer, I guess he could have arrested himself for DWI. A Western Minnesota police officer is facing charges after he rolled his squad car in an alleged drunken wreck last month. Candio, or Candio, County Deputy... Christopher Fatlin is charged with driving while intoxicated and refusing a chemical test. Oh my gosh, do we have his field sobriety test on body cam? Because I'm going to need to see this man try to hop and say the ABC is backwards. Just for science, of course, not to revel in someone's downfall. I mean, that would be schadenfreude of the bad kind. On July 18th, troopers responded to a report of a single crash involving a squad SUV off First Avenue in Genesee Township. The scene of the crash was about 10 miles east of Wilmer. At the scene, troopers found the squad car, a Ford Explorer, heavily damaged, resting on its passenger side. Deputy Fatten was pulled from the vehicle and airlifted to the hospital. A witness said that Fatten's squad crossed First Avenue East and rolled five or six times into a ditch. Before another witness who was driving a semi behind his squad on Highway 12 told troopers that he spotted the squad driving through a stop sign on Highway 12 near Wilmer. According to the charges, truck driver reported that the squad was all over the road on Highway 12, crossing over the center line at times and over the fog line into the grass of the shoulder on the road at other points. And bless this um, truck driver, you know, a lot of times I think, and I'm guilty of it too, we tend to forget that many, many truck drivers are out there and they just want to get home safe and they are driving safely. And the rest of us could be less jackassy. And, you know, pay attention. I tell my girls, if you can't see the mirrors on a truck, they can't see you, give them respect. You know, they're big, big vehicles, but, you know, good on this truck driver for watching out. Due to the circumstances of the crash, Tupers got a warrant to test his blood. However, at the hospital, the charges state Fatten refused the test. However, Troopers did notice the smell of alcohol on his breath and his eyes were bloodshot and glassy. Charges were filed against him last week, about three weeks after the crash. In a statement, County Sheriff Eric Tolson said that the deputy remains on leave after the crash. The sheriff's statement reads in full, I am deeply concerned by the allegations made against Deputy Fatten in the charging documents. They do not reflect or align with the values of our office, the character of our deputies, or the expectations of the people we serve. 
We are taking this situation seriously and cooperating with investigating agencies. Deputy Fatten has been on critical incident leave since the accident, which will continue until the outcome of our internal investigation and criminal proceedings. Sir, you is going to prison. Listen, you know, you put on that badge and we expect higher morals from you. We expect you to follow the rules that you are going to bust the rest of us for. And darken them eyebrows. You have no eyebrows. Look, if I have to darken mine because I've got eyebrows the color of yours, it's called an eyebrow pencil, sir. In sad news, but an update that hopefully will give the family some peace, though I know that losing a child is a pain, a heartbreak that I cannot understand. I haven't walked through and I don't know how you heal that hole in your heart. Nashville police say that Riley Strain had 12 to 15 drinks before his death, according to the reports. Riley Strain, University of Missouri student who disappeared from a night out in Nashville in March before his body was found along Cumberland River, was served 12 to 15 drinks prior to his death, according to a police investigator. An investigation, sorry. A medical examiner determined that Strain 22 had a blood alcohol level of 0.228% and died of drowning and ethanol poisoning, according to Metro Nashville Police Department. Investigation report obtained by WSMV4 investigates. M NPD's investigation also paints a clearer picture as to how Strain consumed so much alcohol in one night on a spring formal trip to Nashville with his UM fraternity, which began on a bus ride from Missouri to Tennessee, about a 6.5 hour drive. According to the report, that's when the drinking began, despite the bus driver's strict no alcohol rule, according to a report obtained by the local news. The business and finance student apparently had at least five drinks on the way to Nashville on March 8th, including vodka shots and IPAs. When they arrived at 4.30 p.m., they went to a Mexican restaurant downtown where he is seen on surveillance drinking a margarita. Surveillance then shows Strain stumbling around 8.40 that evening. According to local media, he was asked to leave Luke's 32 Bridge on Broadway after 9.30, after which Strain began walking in the general direction of his hotel and disappeared. At 9.35 p.m., our security team made the decision based on our conduct standards to escort him from the venue through our Broadway exit and to the front of our building, the bar said in a March 15th statement. He was followed downstairs by one member of his party. The individual with Riley did not exit and returned upstairs. So if I can put out some mom advice, just some mama bear, please maybe think about it and follow it. If you're out doing all the drinking, have a friend, go with your friend. If you know your friend is drunk AF, follow him home. I mean, buddy system, buddy system, buddy system. And I'm sure these young kids who, who didn't walk him home are dealing with this guilt. So I don't want to add to it, but just in future, if you're going out to a place, make sure everyone gets home safe. The Tennessee Alcohol Beverage Commission previously ruled that Strain had not been overserved after conducting its own investigation that involved reviewing security camera footage. It is unclear exactly how and where Strain consumed between 12 and 15 drinks on March 8th. The footage reviewed by TABC apparently did not show Strain visibly drunk, as the other local you know, news station reported. Video footage shared by NNPD after Strain's death showed the 22-year-old stumbling as he walked away from downtown in the direction of the river. Approximately two weeks after Strain disappeared on March 22nd, a worker at a company based along Cumberland River reportedly seeing it, reported seeing a body to police who were later able to confirm that it was Strain. Strain is remembered in his obituary for his commitment to service, dedicating more than 500 hours to the wonders of wildlife, his love for hunting, fishing, and spending time with his family, and his passion for good food. And 
to those kids who are maybe dealing with the grief of not following their friend home, you are not your worst moment. Don't let this define you. Let it be a teachable moment and, you know, grow from this. This, you know, Riley Strain wasn't this moment. He was all the moments that he dedicated to outdoor life, his hunting, his fishing, his, you know, passion for good food, maybe being a good friend. This wasn't the only part of his life that matters. So keep that in mind. And, you know, just be aware of your friends if you're going to go drinking just for Mama Mo so I don't have to, you know, ground everyone. These have been the Newsy News Nuggets for this morning. I hope you guys enjoyed them. Join me tonight for Nightly Newsy News with Mo and, uh, you know, Newsy News Nuggets in the afternoon and hopefully some political stories on Politically Mo and getting back into the swing of things with Fluffy to Fit-ish, uh, you know, my health journey channel. I am getting all of these balls in the air and hopefully I will learn to juggle this week. I will see you guys in a little bit. Have a wonderful day and be kind to yourself, be kind to others and, you know, give out some compliments. They're a great way to socialize as an introvert. Just tell someone you like their t-shirt or their shoes and their face will light up and you, you can allegedly people with other people. Bye guys.